Hi, welcome to the 2024 Dodge Poetry Festival virtual session, Developing a Lexicon Toward Liberation. I'm Isabel Gonzalez, Senior Consultant with Poetry at NJPAC, and I'm very happy to be joined by festival poets, Ricardo Maldonado, Anastasia Rene, and Marcus Wicker. Today, these poets will explore how poets from marginalized and vulnerable communities experiment with new forms and definitions of poetry to create language that is all our own, that which expresses the experiences of our communities. In this session, you will hear from innovative poets who play on the page, offer breathtaking translations, and reclaim power through text and language. These poets will each read for 10 minutes and then we'll create space for a conversation led by our poets. I'm very excited for this session. It's not often I have the opportunity to be in the same space with three poets who push their poems to the edges with such curiosity and hope. Thrilled to hear your poems today, Ricky, Anastasia, and Marcus. Hello, everyone. So glad to be tuning in from Puerto Rico. I have 10 minutes to myself, which feels like such a luxury in times like this. Um, so before I read some of my work, I'm going to start with two loved poems. Um, I like to think of myself as a Puerto Rican poet, therefore, well, I know I'm a Puerto Rican poet, but uh, as someone who's part of an archipelago. Um, and so with that in mind, I'm going to start with a poem by Langston Hughes, Island. Wave of sorrow, do not drown me now. I see the island still ahead somehow. I see the island and its sands are fair. Wave of sorrow, take me there. And then a poem by my friend, the wonderful Nath Natalie Handel um, of the Caribbean and also from Haiti and also uh, of Palestinian descent. Um, a poet I admire for many reasons. Um, Catalog of Happiness. To forget where I came from. To be silent in all the languages I speak. To give up the different dialects mingled in my mind. To give up the desire to leave a far away street before I feel what's missing. To give up the man who didn't realize when we made love, it would be impossible to hurt me. To give up all my maps on Via de la Conciliación where my lover held his foreign name between his teeth. To give up my breath, to let the world bend in my lungs like a branch. To give up my eyes like scarred marble, to see an entire life in a window, releasing the heaviness of the fog. To give up traveling, to let an old sea reach a new sea. To forget all I gave up, to remember where I came from, to make it speak. And some poems I hope are in conversation with these two beloveds. How they cleanse the heart. We do not eat the heart if not its red fiber. It is Thursday. I sleep in the language of my country. I dress the poem in Futura. One says myself, I am a first line. A first line damages song. Nuevo Dia expound on my colony from the outside. A wave has its method. The shroud is my father. Describe democracy. A precedent is a vector. The body a geological insult. These poems, a verdicts towards emergency, delay the assignment. Note, I loved, I loved, I love presently. I picked up my mother's prescription. Move your head to the right of the Republic. 
account for your citizenship with your new address? Did you vote for that civilian? Enter a name for your mother here. I lose my language to corrupt the field. The field is a consensus, a political face. And what does the book invent? If not a heart is not the fire, nor a threshold. It is often that I find myself, as Natalie says, thinking between languages, living between that languages, um, and forgetting myself, <laughs> um, forgetting who I am, if not this webbing of words. Um, this is a poem that describes a particularly difficult moment when a racial epithet or ethnic epithet was thrown at me um, on the train. Um, and this is when you are dragged into your skin, right? Dragged into the person that you are being perceived as. Um, had to use six words today. Once you, America, were a locus and owned, for example, in Brooklyn, an absolute gift, you reached out to me with your charter of rights, a republic of austerity measures and oversight, suggesting I was your subject to your dissertation as I was your reader, America, are you the precedent? The sea train in its abstract melancholy? Then forgive me when I lean towards the mystery inside. For example, our brethren called me Capricorn in Bushwick, Spick in Park Slope, suggested a translation of my last name, but that was in New Jersey. And if I were to find one benediction inside these six walls, it would be Marcus, my boss's cat, the debt bolt making my home out of Thanatos so I may hope to be its human reader. Two weeks after Maria, I sent a text despite keeping no receipt for $3 in that, oh, America, lay your immense wake over me. I alone in my room, I sing for us. I, America, whom you are holding now in hand. Book, forgive me everything. I've gotten up in my used sheets at six in the morning, America with a poem in mind. With four minutes to go, um, I'm gonna read a poem um, that I wrote in Spanish and then translated into English. Uh, these poems came to me immediately after Hurricane Maria made a catastrophic turn across the Virgin Islands and then Puerto Rico um, felt like a finger of God erasing as it went. Um, in many ways, that's the action of empire, right? Um, and my attempt when writing these poems was to find my own form. And in fact, um, when younger writers ask me for advice, I say, take your time, find your form. Um, my form came out of pain, um, but also out of love and generosity towards my family in Puerto Rico and friends in Puerto Rico and um, uh, an ever-growing diaspora. Um, that is our humanity. Lesionado, which means injured. Maybe this will be a poem about power, reading, rereading, whatever shape the intelligence takes. Somewhere, somehow, the men, the state, somewhere seems to destroy, only we should be beautiful and practical Finding beauty. beauty will stand everywhere among two Victorias, my brothers and I among them. Home is a noun. Home is a soil. One, two, three, four, and I among them. Maybe this is a poem about power. Maybe this is a poem about love. Tal vez este sea un poema sobre el poder, leyendo, releyendo cualquier forma que la inteligencia pudiese tomar. De algún modo donde van los hombres, el Estado de algún modo les parece destruir, pero solo debemos ser hermosos y prácticos, encontrando que durará la belleza en todas partes. Entre dos victorias, mis hermanos y yo, ese hogar es sustantivo, ese hogar en su barro, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, y yo entre ellos. Tal vez este sea un poema sobre el poder, tal vez este sea un poema sobre el amor. Thank you so much.
Thank you for that. Um, I always feel so honored to be in the company of other poets. I love to listen to the things we have to say. I want to give honor to um, the poets and writers and artists and creatives that have come before me, um, my ancestors. And I want to give honor just to every poet and writer, writer who is still has the will and the want and the drive and the desire, the need even to do this work. Tonight, I'm gonna read some newer pieces and then uh, end with two poems from Side Notes from the Archivist. Elegy for the underdog. She fought each battle wounded and beautiful with her heart as a lapel pin and her smile as an ascot. When she hugged, she purposely absorbed strangers' pain and left herself open and disposable. Even inside a tossed can, she tried to heal trash. She was a shiny penny in a silver world and no one knew her value was just one cent. And when she left us all here, we counted her up. 100 ways to worship her as a dollar. If we could do it all again, we'd always keep her shiny. We'd always keep her clean with fountains of good luck and ponds of wishes we could see. Egglings. And I will tell all the egglings swiveling off the tits of Saturn that blackness is like gravity. It is the thing that will keep them sutured when all else floats from every joint and each tiny breath. I say to the egglings, hold on, hang on, teeter, but don't let go of each other. When you feel a crack, suck the weight of your yoke back inside yourself and be yellow love. Be bright. Little egglings, how I sit beneath your frames with so much pride that you have made it past the point of being beat, that you are the gap in Baldwin's teeth the wool of Audrey's hair, the sticky fingers of Oshun's sweetness. Egglings, you are gods always and again and again. Circle the date. What is a holiday exactly if we are not allowed to be holy? If we are not allowed to worship our father's bruised skins. What is this celebratory song if there are bombs and blasted parakeets feathering our words? How many bells does it take to ring despair? How many dancing Grinches can you send to a sorrowful mother? to a child snaggled with memory, to a sibling pulled at the root rotting, to a man robbed of his only grain of lineage, to the rice on the stove that never boiled, to the penny you don't have to your name. Ease. If I had been Diana in the Wiz, I may not have been so quick to want to go home. Me and Toto might have wanted to go to a hip hop cipher or watch people spray paint the buildings with abstract art. Home can be a place you love or want to love, a place all clad with nostalgia and negotiations. But if I were Diana, I might have eased on down the road a little slower to kiss a person on the lips and cut my dress shorter to show my shiny black Kansas knees. Might have looked for another Diana and fucked her on the edge of a yellow brick road and told all them, all them witches, Glinda ain't the only thing good up in here. Two final pieces from Side Notes from the Archivist, the pilot series and the Black Girl series. 
In this episode, the Black girl contemplates, am I a cannibal? Am I a cannibal? Am I a cannibal? All the way she boils her rot and gums, her bliss away. How no two fingernails taste alike and eating crow holds the same texture as a lung. The Black girl's current catchphrase, everything gives her life because most days she wants to live. And how can the black girl live when she is the butcher of her own skin? Last piece, episode 24. At the black girl's job, she overheard coworker A tell coworker B that she heard kale is the new vegetable. And black girl thought to herself, there ain't nothing new about kale or collards or mustards or soil underneath a black girl's fingernails. And the black girl's second job, she overheard coworker A tell coworker B how excited she was to go on the camping trip to connect with the nature and the tent and the living on the land and the stars, and the moon, and the water, and the quiet of Mother Earth. Later on in this episode, the Black girl walks a country mile in her own food desert just to get a fresh bunch of greens. The Black girl wonders how it is that she has become Mother Earth's stepchild. How it is she has to pay for the moonlight and water. How it is she fell like a shooting star, how she cannot see her bright in her mother and she focuses on the boundless sky. Thank you. I wanna say thank you to both of my panelists. Um, those poems are amazing and you lifted me up. I'm going to read you um, an excerpt from a project called Dear Mothership. It's a series that I started at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, in 2020, I think like a lot of people, I had a hard time paying attention to anything long form. So novels, nonfiction, even the sort of braided narrative poems that I consider to be my bread and butter, um, they felt difficult to access or pin down. I was always plugged into Twitter and different news outlets. I was on guard against unrest and sickness to such an extent that I couldn't write, right? My mind was filled with so much static, even if I wanted to write. But I had to, literally, because it's the way that I make sense of the world, but also because I was on sabbatical and expected to produce something in exchange for the time outside of the classroom. So after a couple of non-functioning months, I discovered that anything spacey, or vaguely Afrofuturists kept my feet tethered to the ground. So think like George Clinton and Thundercat, Deltron 3030, Sun Ra's weird film, Space is the Place. But the two pieces of art that really gave me a springboard into a writing feeling were the Outcast album, AT Aliens, and Robert Hayden's prose poem, American Journal, about an alien who comes to America in the 70s and sort of experiences the human condition. So eventually I started to ask myself what an alien who came to 2020 Atlanta, an AT alien, might say about the way that we treat one another in this century. Um, and so the, the poems are inspired by Hayden's voice, these sort of fragments and white space sejura, um, but also it's a travel log, a sort of diary-like travel log and the AT aliens' observations uh, are seen through the lens sometimes of outcast lyrics. Um, and the final thing I'll say is it's also a piece of um, a heroic crown of American sonnets. So I'm going to read you a poem from the prologue and then a few from the series and not say much in between. Being an interplanetary alien were you nervous about passing the naturalization test? I used a bootleg library card as passport and travel guide, clicked the free articles, unbricked the paywall, subscribed to the Atlantic Fortune 
the New York Times. I memorized the TOCs, skimmed monthly inequity briefings written by the well-meaning and retweeted, the contemporary heavies, pragmatists, and profiteers. I indexed the Bible and God on your money, lugged Howard Zinn in a rucksack until I was hospitalized for a hernia. I speed read a dusty row of encyclopedias at a pawn shop, work my way from Z to you, where I lingered, surprised to learn the volume contains greater than 50 entries, umpteen of which I am deeply committed to, namely umpires, Zapp and Roger. Both strike me as necessary, fictive. I gorged Fox News and MSNBC, but the lack of lyricism wounded me. All that repetition without elevated feeling, PC police, fascist, socialist agenda, climate hoax, and insert ideology, invective buzzing that fries my circuitry. Frankly, it was exhausting to live as the ancient woke citizen once did, cross-eyed, activated at all times, x-raying the present with Confederate lenses. There are less onerous modes of survival and surely more playalistic ways I can thrive, which is to say, I understand the score and I aced your test, then declined. February 4th, 2020. Dear Mothership, it paralyzes their country, mercy. I will teach them how to be neighborly, how to atomize property lines, how to lubricate the shut mouth of a mailbox, swallow the multiverse, ideas and chapters, presences and pilgrims. I will say to them, God's green card, did not it extend to Egyptians? Were not even the accursed permitted entrance? I will say to them, when blood sash doors are shibboleths, and Wakatio day, I will say to them, solemnly declare, Google it. Then Wikipedia rap radar and Andre Ben taught me this. Alien can blend right on in with your kin. Look again at the lamb's blood and your firstborn, at the ship's log of your manifest destiny. Who are you to say who must leave, who can stay? When rumors of my existence evidence man's belief in dreams. June 18th, 2020. Blue flu hit 171 Atlanta cops after two officers charged in Rayshard Brooks' case. Fox News. Dear Mothership, America where sometimes 911 is small potatoes, fries. The elements answer emergency signal at Wendy's drive through Black citizen dies, killed, shots fired, video, Biggie headline. Biggie headline, black citizen inebriated, wrestles elements weapon, runs, fires, dies in hospital bed. Biggie headline, power drunk element, backshot kills black citizen, retaliates for minor resistance. To be African American, is to be transmogrified. Through the elements glass eye, kernels in flame popcorn, kernels with corns sizzle into popped blisters, and sometimes a drunken public sleep looks like a friable emergency. And sometimes, less often, given video evidence, the elements answer for their crimes with inaction Potatoes boiled, couch ridden, they eschew fault and media coverage, infectious, this elemental view, blackness as bacterial, 
a paralytic sickness bias, blue flame searing through red and white cells. So my brother Brian uh, is a rap producer who lived and worked in Atlanta for the better part of a decade, which meant that I spent a lot of time in the city just cutting up with him. And some of the later poems in this series were generated by just sitting myself in a venue and imagining my surroundings through the speaker's eyes, the ATLian size. June 11th, 2022. ATLian sees Sleepy Brown in concert at City Winery, drinks it in. Moroccan oil dabbed collarbones, shea butter, pumice stones, and all that pimp shit. Release it in gator belts and oxtail patty melts, bow ties and butter leather jackets, caramel cake applejack caps tilted at Hathaway angles and perfume sweat and pheromones, a natural spring running off the songster sloped brim. Breathe in, release it in rose patterned silk shirts, top three buttons blown out, little thickets of black chest coils exposed under chartreuse mood light. Champagne flutes and golden laughter spilling over polished oak tables, pinky rings and diamond teeth, votives, guns holstered, mouths opening to speak to one another in a language that never fails. And then I'll end with this one. It's uh, the 15th sonnet in the crown, the master sonnet, what I'm calling the mother sonnet. June 19th, 2022. Dear Mothership, Earth is reeking, and we, obsidian-backed, winged, cling to the funk in a language that never fails. Peace vibes wonderment and all that pimp shit. An ambrosia we invent to savor roses through the piss. Like witch grass facing a wheat bed with a gangster lean, bias paralyzes their country. White flame searing through red and blue cells, branded into whosoever drinks. America, the perforated straw in a single fold. Stop creasing my visage with grief. If only in the beginning someone said, I wish us the sun and everything under it. Perhaps then we'd survive by friendship, happiness, justice, love. Say together we can do the necessary. If only from the jump pled everyone at the house party. Mothership, teach me how to be neighborly, how to gather light in, then release. Mother, please teach me how to be human. Thank you. Woo! To both of you. Fire, amazing. I kind of want to start all over again. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. I want to hear y'all again. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that always the way you listen and then you're like, ah. ah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, this was, this was wonderful. I think the after hearing the both of you, I have like this burning question that I've had is even more of a burning question. And that is like, what do you consider uh, liberation or being liberated on the on the page? I've I've been struggling with this, so I'd love to hear what both of you think, and then I'll I'll weigh in. So here's a question: Can we make a demarcation between feeling liberated on the page and out off the page? Um, and uh, well, obviously we, I think the three of us can attest to no, right? Uh, they're both intertwined. Uh, but the page, as a way to answer your question, uh, Anastasia, the page gives me perhaps an invitation to be more courageous than I could ordinarily be. 
Um, and so for me, that means, uh, you know, ass of Hurricane Maria, right? But now that I remember it's pre-Maria, it's it's the Pulse shooting that really triggered this writing in, in Spanish from me and then translation, mistranslation into English. Uh, but it's, it's um, I can be formally nonchalant and deadly serious at the same time. Um, and I like that about uh, the the page. And in many ways, I feel very much like a coward outside of it. Um, uh, and and uh, so like form lets me find myself, be myself, be in community. Um, and that's my liberation, right? For that 20 minutes or an hour that I'm in the poem, I'm just making myself legible to myself. And that's for me, liberation, right? Yeah, I like that. Um, I guess my answer is pretty similar. I mean, it's a huge question to tackle, but I mean, very simply for me, liberation just means freedom of choice, like the opportunity to write about whatever one wants to write about and experiment with form outside of the expectations that are typically assigned to poets of color, for me, black poets. I think that there are some moments in my life when I don't feel empowered to speak as freely as I'd like, like during a traffic stop or at a faculty meeting, especially one that's governed by Robert's rules, which I've never cared to learn or had a reason to learn. Um, but the page has always been the place where I've been able to get free. Uh, and in a language sense, for me, sometimes that means just being deglossic, right? Sort of like bringing my hip hop speak with my academic speak um, and sort of putting myself out there in a way that others don't often see. It feels more naked uh, and more human liberation on the page than in actual life, at least for me. I couldn't agree with you both more. Like I, I'm definitely more liberated on the page um, than, you know, who knows what could happen if I'm out here. But I do feel a level of responsibility. I think this is, for me, I feel a level of responsibility to bring some of that liberation in real life. Maybe that's like, I don't know, activism. Maybe that's where the, where the line crosses. But for me, I struggle with, I think part of being liberated for me is acknowledging the hard stuff. I feel like a couple of years ago, everyone was asking me, Anastasia, what's giving, what's bringing you joy or giving you joy? And I don't know if it's like nothing, nothing is bringing me or giving me joy. You know what? Because nobody can give me joy. It's my birthright. You, nobody can give it to me or take it. I always have joy, no matter if the bad stuff is happening. But that's what made me ask about being liberated on the page because I was, I felt like in order to do that or fall into place, I needed to write, everybody wanted to hear happy, <laughs> happy, happy things. And for me, being liberated on the page means I get to talk about the hard stuff. I get to talk about the pain. I get to talk about the sorrow. I get to talk about good and bad. So that that's something I, I, I struggle with. I, I thank you both for your answers because it is, it's always running in my mind and also feeling sad that I even have to ask my colleagues and peers what makes you feel liberated because I feel like we should just be, we should just feel that way without um, asking ourselves definitions. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, to your point, Anastasia, I, uh, there's something, right? Like we get to set the terms of our liberation when we're writing, when we're living when we're occupying space, when we're inter intersecting with other humans, right? And like the, the project of, I'd like to think that the project of humanity is understanding how all of our liberations interlock, right? Intersect with each other. Um, but um, I also wanted to say like, as it applies to writing, which is part of this, I was at an event with uh, Andres Serpa um, some, some years ago and he used to write poems. He was, he was in, a, a a guard at an art gallery in Long Island and um sorry Staten Island Long Island I can't remember and so he would write poems when he wasn't a guard like he would take breaks and so like I I've always thought of Andres like uh, 
poems happening outside of surveillance, uh, outside of the act of surveillance. Um, and um, I think that's also how, like, it's it's sort of interesting the way that that may inform how we all see our uh, liberation in, in writing, right? It's outside of anyone else's surveillance, the market surveillance, what they expect us to write about, right? Like if I have to write my I like to live in America poem over and over again, right? Um, I I I I cannot do it, right? Yeah, I can see us all nodding, feeling the same way on on the inside. Yeah, and and one thing that I guess that I should have mentioned, I guess I just didn't have enough time. For me, writing those mothership poems was particularly freeing just because one, I couldn't write it all. And two, because, um, well, so I started with one piece, right? I started with an American sonnet. I started with this, with fragments and white space sejura. All of those things were elements, craft elements that let me actually write because I couldn't focus on anything during the pandemic, right? And so I didn't know that I was writing a heroic crown. I just liked the last line of the first poem and I picked it up as the next, right? But typically when poets write a heroic crown of sonnets, they start with that 15th poem and then they take all those lines and they plug them back in. I did not do that, which meant that at some point, you know, I wanted to start with a new line and I thought, well, I'm writing this crown. If I start with a new line that wasn't the previous last line, then is it actually a heroic crown of sonnets? Like, does that work in the tradition, right? And so for me, liberation meant like, all right, I'm just gonna have to fix this in post. And my third poem, I'm gonna start with a new line and figure this out. And so what happened over the course of two years, I created this thing called uh, the breakbeat crown. Instead of using those lines, those last lines in order or using a whole line, I used like a half of one line and a half of another, which was akin to, you know, sampling and hip hop, right? And then I gave myself um, two sonnets that were submerged, like the two turntables, and I created my, created my own version of this heroic crown, right? And the process um, of being free to create um, liberated me in a way that change the way that I write. I think that this third book will be high lyric. Uh, it'll contain less narrative poems. It'll sound less like Marcus, the Marcus and the other two books. Um, and I didn't even realize that I was allowed to do that, right? Until forced to because of the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think that there is liberation in form, right? Like, and I, I struggle with this too. I, I created a form called the nines, um, which, it, which is nine stanzas, nine lines, nine section headers, and it needs to be about nine series of things, nine hours, nine minutes, nine lovers, nine heartbreaks or whatever. Um, and so even though I like to break form, it was liberating to create, <laughs> to create a form or think that I created, you know, nothing is new, who knows, maybe I'll find out like, 80 years ago, somebody created the nines. Forgive me, ancestor, if that's the case. But I find that there's liberation for me in breaking form. And then there is liberation in creating form because sometimes you just want to be the goddess of the page. You want, you want to have that control. So I was actually going to ask you both about, do you think that creating and breaking form is a part of the this like liberation that we don't necessarily get to have in the in the real world. You want to take it, Marcus, or should I jump in? That's all you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it's, here's the interesting thing about me and form. Um, although, you know, um, the for me, form is difficult for many reasons, primarily of which is um you know most of my education came through right um iambic pentameter right that's how we all sort of like on ramp onto form um and then you expand onto other geographies and other histories right but um you can't write an iambic pentameter in spanish it's just that's not how the language works and so it always feels artificial to me and i took this form form class prosody class uh in grad school and 
thanks to the generosity of my teacher, I was able to pass it because, you know, like he, uh, he invited me to write uh, in form and I said, well, I can't do this. And he gave me like six months to work on a project um, because, and it's all like the exercise uh, of, of writing in form was diff it just felt very disingenuous to me. Um, and even when I, because it sounds linguistically disingenuous, but there are there are sonnets in Spanish, of course. Um, there's syllabics. There's all sorts of there are all sorts of poems. But for some reason, I just can't latch onto it. Uh, but one day I'll get there, right? One day I'll find myself in that little home. When I think about uh, your breakbeat crown because i also love you i don't know how you feel but both of you i'm a lover of music it creeps into my writing it creeps into my fiction it creeps into my nonfiction. it creeps into poetry and so i was really sort of hanging on my seat when you were like it's like the turntables and i'm like now you're speaking you're speaking my language so i guess and then i'll be quiet i'm just you all are wonderful so i, I i'm like i have you here i want to ask these questions what what music um, do you feel is the most, I don't want to say liberating, but the frequency, I feel like music has a frequency for me and I need that frequency when I'm writing. Is there a certain song or a certain type of music that you really vibe off the frequency? You find that it, it seeps into your work or into your soul or helps you, what, what would that be for you all? Yeah, I mean, I've always said that, you know, in order to sort of quiet my mind, I need the type of music that feels like I could hit a bump in a Cadillac and just like sort of keep going. And so for me, sometimes that's like jazz fusion. Um, it's jazz from the 70s, like Fela Kuti. Um, I've been listening to lots of European jazz at this point. Um, you know, my, I mean, my first two books, both of them are sort of entrenched in hip hop. The second section of the first book is called Beats, Breaks, and B-Sides. And I don't know if it's that I'm getting older and that I'm like turning into my father or something like that. But the sort of the the, the post-bop jazz rhythms, for some reason, they quiet something in my mind that allows me to access slant rhymes in a way that actually hip hop doesn't when I'm writing. Um interesting about like music my 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 frame of reference is you know i write to the amazing ballads from the 80s and 90s um in english and in spanish uh so i have a whole repertoire of latin american music um and i also have you know what came from the continental us um and um so i can switch from something like chicago to uh ricky martin um in fact, I remember being young um, and um, his album Vuelve came out um, and the lyrics of the song were were published in the local newspaper. And I we were I remember sitting with friends and thinking, how is he getting an additional syllable in this line? It just doesn't scan properly. And then I listened to it and it made perfect sense. He just sort of like skipped out of the line and then went back in it. Um, and it was great. It was like a, a quick heartbeat of a of a moment. Um, so yeah, ballads. And I think like my next my next book, I think I'm gonna dress it up with uh, quotations from ballads um, and just make it really like part of part of the texture of the book. Nothing like you know mopping my floors and singing full throatedly um, a good ballad from the '90s or '80s. Um, I have a question, Marcus. Wait, do you do you have one? I do, I do. Go ahead. In that, uh, Ricardo and Anastasia, both of you seem very keen in terms of honoring um, your ancestors in the work, right? Like we're standing on the shoulders of of giants, and you want others to know that. It just makes me curious. Like, what are the legacies that you hope to leave behind on the page? I know that's a a wild question, right? Um, but I want to know. I just wanted to say, Marcus, that that's kind of the question I was gravitating towards. I wanted to frame it in like as an archive. What are the archives that you're bringing with yourself and you want to keep um, keep long, like keep into the future? So 
Um, and it, I think this is a line I keep going on to, going back to. Um, and it's like, um, I think like we need each other critically. Um, and so whether it is um, the voice of someone who came before whom you met uh, through a metaphysical encounter or through literature, right? Or through stories um, or like, I, what would it mean if we all treated each other as ancestors? Um, and uh, if we all saw in each other that promise of futurity, right? Belonging to a future archive that we'll, we're building. Um, so that's, a, I, I guess, a way of answering your question. Um, uh, but I, I, I also want to bring more Spanish into my poems, right? And that's a particular kind of archive that I'm really eager to, uh, to embrace and, and to seed, right, into future generations. But that has been happening since day one. So, like, it's not particularly new for a Puerto Rican poet to be code switching in that sense. I think this is one of those times where I'm trying not to, I, I, I take copious notes all the time. When I, if I go to a panel or a talk and I, my mind is like, ah, so many notes I wanna take from things that both of you have said, but um, to broadly answer both of your questions, I do think a lot about the legacy that I'm leaving. And at the same time, I try to force myself to be present um, so I guess I'm just confessing it, the, there's a, a struggle sometimes with me to just be like, I'm present, you know, I'm here with you all, we're talking, we're writing, it's wonderful. Then there's always this part of my brain that is actually asking that question, like, what am I going to leave that is important to people? What are they even going to read of mine. And I think I struggle with the legacy of the page, right? The legacy of the people where you're like, oh, that poem, that poem. And then the and then the the legacy of my consciousness and my moral character. I'm still trying to figure out like, how can I leave a positive legacy of both? Because I have known great uh writing ancestors that maybe um <laughs> Maybe not the greatest in the world, but they but still a writing ancestor and vice versa. Maybe some people are like wonderful in the world, but not particularly writers or creatives. So I think for me, I struggle with how to leave a positive legacy in in both realms. And I think my biggest lesson in that is not having any regrets. I think that goes back to being trying to be present and not too too yeah. far in the past and not too far in the future because I just don't want to I just want to leave a legacy of no regrets. I want somebody to say, "Man, Anastasia Renee knew how to laugh." And then, you know, here's these books you should read of Anastasia Renee. It's like I So I don't I don't think it fully answers, but I'm just struggling with the with with the the overall legacy that that I want to leave. I think that's a perfect answer and maybe even a perfect place to leave it. Well, this was Thank you all so much. That was amazing. And, and what I was surprised at was um, throughout your readings, how much I was laughing at the unexpected moments in, in all of your work. I, I found myself, it was like they were hard truths, but also there were moments of like, oh my gosh, this is happening in a poem, which is amazing. And something also that I loved, Ricky, is what you said when you said, um, we get to set the terms of our liberation. I think that's so uh, so brilliant. And, um, and you all are doing that in your work, in your lives. And I just appreciate this conversation. So thank you all. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. And muchas bendiciones. Have a good night. Take care. Bye.